Thank you, Chairman. And uh, Chairman mentioned that I am the last speaker of this session, and uh, I always feel that it is always unfortunate for the last speaker in a session. <laughs> Why is uh, the psychological uh, pressure? Is because the audience has already heard so many excellent uh, speeches, and uh, another is uh, time pressure because Chairman or asked me that uh, I should uh, curtail my speech in, within 10 minutes. But I bargain, then at, at last we make a deal, and that's 12 minutes. I hope that I can <laughs> observe it. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> my honorable uh, Sri Lanka hosts, my dear friends, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, ensuring national security through reconciliation and a sustainable development is an extremely important and appealing topic in international studies. Uh, and uh, today I'm particularly honored to give a presentation on this topic in Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka has done such a good job and has made such outstanding success in this respect. Uh, <clears throat> It's in global perspective, it will be safe to say that reconciliation and a sustainable development has become increasingly integrated into national strategies to achieve security and stability. So let's first look at this overview. Uh, it's an overview of global trend. This phenomenon, or rather to call it a global trend, started approximately from, 1990, from 1990s. Since then, Many countries, I think, uh, from Africa to Balkan area, uh, from to uh, Balkan region, from Middle East to South Asia, uh, from Southeast Asia to some regions in Latin America, I think more and more people, uh, more and more countries, are uh, aware that only through effective reconciliation and sustainable development can they achieve enduring security and stability. However, when we look at these countries like Rwanda. Has, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, we can see that, or including Sri Lanka, we can see that they are highly diversified, at least in terms of domestic security conditions. For the purpose of facilitate, uh, facilitating related research and analysis, these countries can be categorized into at least six types. One, post-Civil War uh, conflict countries. Uh, second, post counterinsurgency and counterterrorism countries, and post-war countries. Uh, in many articles and papers on reconciliation and national security, Iraq and Afghanistan are often categorized as post-counterinsurgency uh, or post-counterterrorism uh, uh, country. Actually, it will be more precise to name them as post-war countries, since the post or uh, since the counterterrorism and the counterinsurgency operations within their territory are mainly conducted by foreign troops. And the fourth, countries are still in conflict. Fifth, country dealing with domestic, uh, domestic strife. And the sixth, countries just are taking preventive reconciliations. So here I have to confess that uh, the above types are to some extent overlapping with each other, uh, especially between the uh, post-war type and the uh, countries are still in conflict. So let's see the second uh, part, it's reconciliation. Um, actually, reconciliation or fostering understanding and uh, trust between groups of peoples divided by violence and mistrust is always the top uh, priority on the related government's uh, political agenda and it is always a long-term, most subtle and complex undertaking that the nation faces. So when we look at the reconciliation strategies taken by those countries, we can see that despite highly diversified domestic conditions of them, there is some essential similarity. That is, such strategy is often designed as multi-throned one. Steps taken in different fields are usually integrated for one single purpose. That is to eliminate the deep-rooted mistrust and hatred caused by the unfortunate past. Uh, and to achieve reconciliation among groups and communities. We can see the following steps are widely adopted and very often included in reconciliation strategies. 
First is uh, creating enabling uh, environment. For many countries, the reconciliation process began by creating an enabling environment for reconciliation to take place in earnest. Creating uh, the enabling envi environment involves such things as ensuring peace and security in all parts of the, uh, of the country, uh, return of refugees to their home, kick-starting uh, kick normal economic and social activity, and improving access to medical and other humanitarian services. And the second is strengthening law system during the process of reconciliation. Uh, this step is extremely important. Uh, that, this step means making the reconciliation process more transparent, more predictable, and can minimize suspicion as well as other negative uh, social psychologic, psychology, which could so often undermine reconciliation efforts. Strengthening law system also means ruling out future attempts to take advantage of the unfortunate past. In some countries, to raise religious or ethnic issues for electoral or other political purpose is strictly forbidden by law. And this plays an important role in reconciliation or preventive reconciliation. A third one is the institutional arrangement. It is mainly a political one. In most countries, uh, building institutional infrastructure is fundamental to reconciliation process. It is to guarantee that each group or party has necessary political incentive to join the, to, uh, join the process, and they don't have to seek other ways. And setting up local administrative, uh, and uh, setting up national administrative structure inclusive of all people of different background, and setting up local administrative structure that local ethnic and religious groups can play a proportionate role. And uh, ensuring legislative body represents all the people, groups, and the communities across the nation. And I think it is the last, uh, is not the least, is equally important. You can practice, I think, uh, checks and balances or any sort of political principle in the, within the government or in, across the globe. But one thing you have to ensure, that is ensuring the administration has necessary power to push forward the reconciliation process. I think it's a very interesting and important. In, uh, Samuel Huntington studies modernization. He emphasized the role of power. And in, he, in his famous book, he articulated that uh, power concentrates, uh, concentrates necessary power to push forward the the modernization is very important, particularly at the first half of uh, modernization. Uh, to some extent, this conclusion is applicable to reconciliation process. And the fourth one is social economic approach, and I think we have already heard enough uh, advices and materials in this respect, so I skipped it. And cooperation with international com uh, community. International community, the UN in particular, can play an important supportive role in all the above steps. However, the national administration should always take the lead. In many cases, the capacity of national or local government is the key variable during the reconciliation process. It is safe to say that the most effective and capable national government can ensure the most successful cooperation with the international community. And the last one, uh, but not least, is continuing efforts to fighting against sectarian uh, ideology. Uh, let's look at uh, the sustainable development. It is another indispensable pillar. Actually, sustainable development and reconciliation are two mutually supportive pillars for the national security and the stability. However, for some countries, the most crucial problem is not how to realize sustainable development, but how to achieve some basic economic recovery and prevent the nation from falling back into chaotic and a desperate uh, situation. But for most or many other countries, sustainable development remains imperative and uh, indispensable. The concepts uh, the concept of sustainable development was openly discussed as early as 1972. In spite of various editions, the core meanings of sustainable development is establishing harmonious relations among economy, society, and environment. It is a task for nearly all the countries across the globe and for human beings as a whole. 
However, for those countries in process of reconciliation, it also means a guarantee as well as a driving force for reconciliation. For those countries, to achieve sustainable development, I mean in the near future, should stress more on the interactions, I think, between economy and society. That is to enlarge the number of people who can benefit from economic development and to build a society. In China, he was known as Fa Xian, and Fa Xian came to Sri Lanka in the 5th century to collect a very important text called the Vinay Pitaka, a text on discipline. And one of the key principles of that text that Fa Xian collected from Sri Lanka and took to China, there's a reference to time, time management. So I believe the practice in China of time management was taken from the Vinay Pitaka. 